Good morning, let's pray. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us in the Scriptures, and we ask that you will help us now to hear your voice, to have open ears and soft and warm hearts. Help us to believe your word and to learn to obey it in Jesus' name. Amen. He's not quite sure what to do with his life. His relationships never seem to deliver quite the happiness they promise. He's rather lonely. He's sure there must be something more to life. But he just doesn't seem to be able to grasp what it is. Such is the situation of the central character in a novel that sold millions of copies around the world. He is yearning for a fuller life. The book says, we're beginning to glimpse an alternative kind of experience, moments in our lives that feel different somehow, more intense and inspiring. But we don't know what this experience is or how to make it last. And when it ends, we're left feeling dissatisfied and restless with a life that seems ordinary again. Doesn't that sum up what so many feel? It's the adult version of the child who thinks nothing ever happens in my life. There are never any adventures for me. It's a restless dissatisfaction searching for a fix, for a way out of humdrum, ordinary life. Well, over the coming weeks, we have a treat in store as we learn together from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. You can find the letter to the Colossians on page 983 in the Bibles. If you're not there uh, yet already, it'd be great to have that open in front of you. And this morning we're looking at those first eight verses that we just heard. Now, to get a handle on this letter, we need to grasp the situation that the Apostle is addressing. He is writing to a young church that is struggling to stand firm in a pervasive atmosphere of restless dissatisfaction. That was the air that these relatively new Christians were breathing from the culture around them, and it was getting into their lungs. And maybe the same kind of air gets into our lungs as well. And this temptation to dissatisfaction was being made worse, it seems, by new teaching that had come into the church. It didn't just draw attention to the problem, it promised an answer. Reading between the lines of this letter, it seems that this new teaching was full of the promise of deep insight, deep experience, and deep satisfaction. No more humdrum, ordinary existence. Here was a route to fullness of life. Knowledge and power were on offer, and all in a seemingly Christian framework. This new teaching was, it seems, all clothed in the language of the Christian faith. So there was no open call to reject the gospel of Christ and go a different way. They were not being told to reject Christ in order to accept this kind of new age route to fullness of life. The message was rather, bring Christ with you. There's plenty of room for him, but you need a boost. You need an additional dimension to your thinking and experience. And when the Apostle Paul hears that this is the kind of thing they're being told, he smells a very large rat. He sees that the answer that they're being offered for their dissatisfaction is a false hope. It is an empty promise. It is subtly drawing them away from the gospel which they had believed. It is suffocating their faith. And he says to them, in effect, stop breathing that air. Get back into the fresh air of the gospel. The right response to dissatisfaction is to take a firmer hold on Christ. Christ alone is the answer. True knowledge and power and riches belong to him. They are found in him alone and any other promise is a dangerous deadly delusion so for instance in chapter 2 verse 2 Paul says that his purpose 
is to encourage them so that they might reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. And he goes on, chapter 2, verse 6, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Chapter 2, verse 10, You have been filled in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 17, The substance belongs to Christ. Anyone who teaches otherwise, he says in 2.19, is not holding fast to the head, that is to Christ. What is the answer to dissatisfaction? It's there again in chapter 1, verse 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, says Paul. So this is a Christ-saturated letter which is seeking to produce Christ-saturated Christians. Paul wants them to understand all that God has done and is doing and will do through Christ. So he writes to them this friendly but forceful letter to get them back on track. As for Paul's own situation, he's in prison. With him is Epaphras, Epaphras was from Colossae, a member of Paul's team, and the one who'd done the pioneering evangelism in his hometown. Although Paul is in prison, he is characteristically unbowed by his hardship and suffering in the service of the gospel. The whole letter, and not least these opening verses, show him to be thankful, prayerful, and concerned. What then of chapter 1, verses 1 to 8? Well, I have two headings. First of all, be thankful that God has given us faith and love. And secondly, be thankful that God is using us to grow the church. First of all, then, be thankful that God has given us faith and love. The letter begins with Paul's greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Even in these brief opening greetings, uh, these are packed with theological punch and practical power if we take them to heart and find our deepest identity in what Paul says about himself and about us. We belong to Christ. We are members of his family. We are servants, saints, siblings, and subjects of Christ. And after that greeting in verses 1 and 2, Paul turns in verses 3 to 8 to thanksgiving, which is the antidote to wrong kinds of dissatisfaction. A bit later on in verses 9 to 14, Paul's prayer of thanksgiving for the Colossians turns to prayer of intercession and he asks God to meet their needs and to change them and that is the antidote to right kinds of dissatisfaction. Ramsey's going to take us through that next Sunday. Let me just give you a little preview to clarify what it is that Paul is giving thanks for here in verse 3. So he prays, verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, just what God has done for them by grace through that faith, Paul spells out in verses uh, 13 and 14. He, that is God the Father, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we used to be subjects of Satan, enslaved in the dark dungeon of the devil's dominion. No light, no hope, no way of escape. No one to blame but ourselves. We locked ourselves in and threw away the key. 
but God our Father redeemed us. That means he brought us out of slavery. Christ his Son paid the redemption price and we've been set free. The door of the dungeon has been thrown open. We've been redeemed and more than that even, we've been delivered, rescued. Not only has the price been paid, but also we've been carried out of the dungeon to safety. Our captivity left us too weak to walk unaided, but Christ has lifted us on his broad shoulders and brought us out into the light. Joyful gratitude, thankfulness, is the right response to rescue. We've been redeemed, we've been delivered, and more than that even, verse 12, we've been qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. One time, willing subjects of, of the enemy are now children of the king and heirs of the kingdom. Redeemed delivered and qualified for glory all of that we have received through faith in Christ he has done it for us we don't yet see it with our physical eyes but we do see it with the eyes of faith that is the sure hope that he's given us that is the foundation of true Christian experience which Paul gives thanks thanks for in verses 3 to 6. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. The word of the truth, the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done comes to us. We hear it. We believe it's true. It fills us with hope. Not wishful thinking, but a confident, certain hope. And this hope leads to two more things, faith and love. Hope leads to faith, which is a daily trusting of our lives to Christ. And hope leads to love for the saints, for our new brothers and sisters who, like us, have been redeemed and delivered and qualified for glory. Verse 5, this faith and love are because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. That is what God has already done for us in Christ. And there is nothing ordinary, humdrum, unexciting and unsatisfying about that gospel. And what's the real test of whether we've grasped that gospel? It is how much we do overflow with thanksgiving. When we've understood what God has done, how could we possibly need or want to look beyond Christ for anything else? Everything is to be found in him. So let's be thankful that God has given us faith and love. Secondly, be thankful that God is using us to grow the church. Not only are we given royal status as Christians, we're given a role to fulfill in the purposes of the king. You may be aware that the Athletics World Championships in Budapest have just finished. From a very different games, there is an amazing piece of film of Jesse Owens causing Hitler grief at the Berlin Olympics back in the 1930s when he won his fourth gold medal in the relay. And the baton gets passed from one member of the team to the next as he took up the race. And so it is with the gospel. Verse 6, in the whole world, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing as it does also among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. This is part of what Paul is thanking God for. Effective evangelism 
is God's work through us. It's never our work alone. That's why the progress of the gospel in the end is unstoppable. God is the one who is growing gospel fruit. And Paul reminds the Colossian Christians that their own experience is a powerful example of that. Verses 7 to 8. You learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So from Paul to Epaphras, from Epaphras to Colossae, so the gospel takes root throughout the world, from life to life, from town to town, from nation to nation, and the gospel has come to you, and it's come to me. And so it goes on in our own day. We live in a part of the world that's sadly an exception to the rule of global church growth. So we don't tend to have a very accurate perspective about what's going on, but the truth is that the number of Christians in the world is growing massively all the time. Last year, Vivian and I visited Buri in Kenya for the 35th anniversary of our partnership with our brothers and sisters in Christ there, and we stayed with our old uh, friends, friends of JPC, Mwendwa and Joyce. I remember uh, very clearly when I first went there meeting Wendwa's grandmother, who at that time was about 100 years old. She's now gone to glory. She radiated faith and love because of the hope that was in her. Her husband was the very first man to preach the gospel in that part of Kenya in the early part of the last century. Now the population is majority Christian. Dick Lucas, in his book on Colossians, quotes a summary published by the National Christian Council of Kenya. It said, wherever the word of God, the preaching of the good news went amongst the animistic tribal populations of Kenya, the response was instantaneous, immediate, and enormous. And Dick Lucas comments, this spontaneous expansion of the church is due then to, to the productive power of the simple gospel message. Presumably, therefore, the implications of Paul's words are that there is no need for the kind of enrichment that the false teachers were claiming to bring. What is God doing through the church? He is rescuing people out of every nation, tribe, and language through Christ and for Christ. And we are part of that marvelous plan. God is using us too to grow his church. And there is no deeper satisfaction to be found than in being part of that. There is no experience of fullness of life that can compete with a place in the purposes of Christ. So what kind of men and women do we need to be for maximum usefulness in the hands of the Holy Spirit? Well, Paul's team member Epaphras is our example. He was, says verse 7, a beloved fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ. He told the Colossians about Christ. He told Paul about the faith of the Colossians. He was full of faith himself, full of love, and he was full of prayer. At the end of this letter, Paul says of Epaphras, this is chapter 4, verse 12, that he was always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. It's the kind of person that God can use to grow the church. It's the kind of person you and I have been redeemed to be. So let's not squander what we've been given through ingratitude and dissatisfaction that leads us down blind alleys. Edward Irving was a Scottish preacher in the 19th century who shot to fame in London because he was a very great orator. But he was dissatisfied. He was not content with the simple gospel. He said to a fellow minister, you are content to go backward and forward on the same route like a ferry. But as for me, I hope to go deep into the ocean of truth. Now you will see what I will do. A higher style of Christianity was what he was after. 
He ended his life with his ministry ruined, dying of tuberculosis, but believing that he was about to be suddenly and completely healed, given the power to perform all kinds of miracles and to begin a ministry similar to that of the early apostles. Even after he died, some of his followers apparently believed that God would raise him from the dead to resume his ministry. He stayed dead. His life is a warning that we must not seek knowledge of God or power for living beyond what's given to us in Christ and the gospel. Paul wrote from his prison cell, in the whole world, the gospel is bearing fruit and increasing. So what about us? Are we full of a restless dissatisfaction that's searching for a quick fix? Or are we thankful? Are we overflowing with thankfulness for the faith and love that God has given to us? Are we overflowing with thankfulness for the fact that God is using us to grow his church? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the faith and love that you've given to us by the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We thank you for the way that you are growing your word and your church around the world. Thank you too for the growth of your word in us and through us. And Lord, we ask that you will deepen this spirit of thankfulness in us as we grasp more deeply today and in the coming weeks the wonder of your gift to us of Jesus and all that he's done for us once for all. In his name we pray. Amen. So our next song is spot on. In Christ alone my hope is found. Let's stand and let's sing together. <laughs>